I am currently in the midst of reading a 1926 book by the American Everett Dean Martin. He was a minister, writer, journalist, instructor, lecturer, social psychologist, social philosopher, and an advocate of adult education. Very much a worthwhile and relevant figure who, whilst being criminally underrated or even unknown, actually produced a number of works which ought to be considered great additions to the tapestry of history and culture, whilst also remaining highly prescient in assisting our understanding of the world we live in today. Martin wrote extensively on the phenomenon of crowd psychology and the hive mind mentality. He was best known for his advocacy of the liberal education of adults, which he saw as an antidote to both the irrationality of the crowd and the power of propaganda. Authentic liberal education consists of a depth in and breadth of knowledge, akin to that of a polymath or generalist, primarily achieved through a high standard of literacy. Martin asserts that an educated person is not merely one who can do something, whether it is giving a lecture on the poetry of Horace, running a train, trying a lawsuit, or repairing the plumbing, an educated person is also one who knows the significance of what he does, and he is one who cannot and will not do certain things. He has acquired a set of values. He has a yes and a no and they are his own. He knows why he behaves as he does. He has learned what to prefer, for he has lived in the presence of things that are preferable. It does not mean that he is merely trained in the conventions of polite society or the conformities of crowd morality. It is doubtless that he will depart from both in many things. Whether he conforms or not, he has learned enough about human life on this planet to see his behavior in the light of a body of experience and the relation of his actions to situations as a whole. Such a person is acquiring a liberal education and it makes little difference whether he has been formally trained in philosophy or mechanics. He is being transformed from an automation into a thinking being. Thus far in my reading of Martin's work, it is very much apparent that one of the main takeaways from the book will be the expression of the dialectic between liberal education and what Martin refers to as animal training. One of the earliest examples that Martin refers to when discussing animal training is education of the medieval era, which equated to scholasticism. Scholastic education of that epoch being very rigid and algorithmic education. Thus, liberal education at that time was basically pious contemplation. The dictionary definition of scholasticism is as follows. The system of theology and philosophy taught in medieval European universities based on Aristotelian logic and the writings of the early Christian fathers, emphasizing tradition and dogma. Basically, the narrow-minded insistence on traditional doctrine. Whilst the Greeks are a great example of an efficient civilization, one only needs to dabble in my Spenglerian relativistic discussions on the classical culture in other videos to recognize that the Greeks were a very rigid people, both in spirit and practice, living entirely for greatness in the present rather than in the future. 
fundamentally different and alien to the traditional Westerner whose Faustian cultural world feeling projects a different soul image onto the world, which is future-orientated, insatiable, and boundless in its ambition. This is why a carbon copy reintroduction of Greek systems of governance or regime is largely inconceivable in the modern world and is thus likely to fail. No matter how much an elite class may want to implement it, that's not to say it won't be attempted as mere imitation. If we are to take anything away from the classical culture, it ought to be their strength of mind and emotional control, characterized by the philosophy of Stoicism. Aside from that, anything more from a large-scale structural standpoint is bound to be poorly executed. It is rather fascinating, then, that we are effectively in a new medieval era of neo-feudalism with a standardized doctrine passing for enlightened education. Right now, History is ultimately rhyming with medieval times, right down to the style of education. There's no denying that the golden mean of Aristotelian virtue and the classical ideal of the good life, or eudaimonia, which translates to happiness or well-being, is worthwhile knowledge for an individual to possess and aspire towards, yet it must be understood that the classical conceptions of things like freedom, education, and citizenship were very different to our modern conceptions, and were not necessarily innate, but earned or imparted through social status, virtuous behavior, and fulfillment of civic duties. It is conceivable that as larger and larger numbers of people achieved freedom in the modern world, a liberal education might have done in our day what the Greeks sought to do in theirs, that is, lay the foundation of freedom in a well-considered basis of philosophy. Yet, gradually, things degenerated into narrow utilitarianism and mere mechanical efficiency. Sadly, philosophy is not considered useful by modern standards, however debatable that may be. Modern education may be considered broad, but to call it liberal education requires both humour and imagination. Little attempt is made to get behind the language into literary appreciation, or back of the literature to the ways and values of ancient life and the wisdom of the ages or to see the relation of such wisdom to the problems of living in the modern world. Nowadays, this just doesn't happen often, if at all. Math teachers may teach Pythagoras' theorem, but give little to no background whatsoever on Pythagoras himself, undoubtedly because they themselves don't know the background and specialize entirely in the theory so the lesson lacks all deeper meaning and context. Personally, as a romantic thinker, I would have been far more interested in and enthusiastic about mathematics in my youth had there been a deeper cultural or historical context attached to the lessons, and not just mere repetition of theories, formulas, and data that no modern teenager was wise enough to see the value in, which made them wonder when they would ever need to use such information, especially if they were not seeking a career in a relevant field. Even in 1926, Martin asserted that traditional education has again become an artificial thing, aloof from reality, a higher knowledge set apart by itself, that is, if one may call it knowledge at all. Most college graduates, after a few years, do not remember enough Latin to enable them to translate their own diplomas. So badly are the classics taught, even as a mere language drill. 
whilst nowadays one would be lucky to find an instance where the classics are taught at all, let alone to a minimum standard. It is guaranteed that the average student will cram before an exam, regurgitate the information required, and then leave the exam only to quickly forget much of what he has supposedly learned. Martin says that after the Renaissance, members of the nobility and gentry, and later an increasing number of the middle class, sought higher education for its refining influence as an adornment rather than as a way of life. A personal example of this phenomenon is when I was lucky enough to procure a collection of the 60 great books of the Western world, and I was told by the man who sold them to me that he was glad to be selling them to someone with a clear passion for the material, who would discuss them, read them, and appreciate them properly by actually using them to formulate his worldview, unlike the other people who had expressed interest in the collection just to have them as a mere status symbol sitting on the shelf of their reading room. The notion of modern education emulating animal training ought to be obvious to any intellectually honest person. In today's world of science worship, not only are the best known psychological experiments demonstrations of the conditioning of reflexes in animals, namely Pavlov's dogs and B.F. Skinner's rats, but modern education itself resembles that phenomenon. It is said that there is no essential difference between this animal training and our learning, whether it be to swim or play tennis, memorize a poem, solve a problem in algebra, or to master the technique of a profession. One's education thus consists wholly of one's organized systems of responses or habit patterns. We often speak of education as the necessary development of personality, but from this point of view, personality is nothing but the sum total of an individual's conditioned reflexes. That is, it is merely the manner in which the organism has been taught to work. Behavioral psychology has been known to compare personality to the running of an engine. According to Martin, the method of animal training, which is taken for granted, is open to serious criticism. Primarily, the theory proceeds on the assumption that insight into the situation is not necessary to learning. As an example, an animal, a cat, may be placed in a cage, the door of the cage being so arranged that escape is possible only when the cat strikes a certain latch. After a period during which the cat makes all sorts of frantic random movements, the successful movement finally occurs and the cat escapes the cage. The experiment is thus repeated, and perhaps the period of futile activity will gradually decrease. After a number of trials, the cat will give up the random movements and at once unlock the door. The gradual shortening of the interval of time required for the desired response was then plotted. The graph created by the collection of data was called the animal's learning curve. It would be safe to then assume that this is where the term learning curve comes from, as such curves may have also been made of human learning processes. Yet something important to acknowledge is that the cat in the cage first hits upon the successful gesture as a matter of pure chance. It's questionable whether the cat learned anything or whether the cat just initially lucked out before escaping. In repeat trials, the situation becomes overdetermined and is fixed as a habit. In such habit formation, learning is mere repetition, 
There is nothing of independence of judgment, no reflection on ends, no development of the capacity to deal with new situations. The better one is trained, the more automatic one's behavior becomes. It is doubtful whether such training is learning at all. Hence the test subject, be they an animal or human, need never take in the situation. The successful action, the more this learning process is perfected, degenerates into a mere gesture related to the event in a purely external, arbitrary and algorithmic manner. Actions are thus automated but not understood. Obviously, it is difficult to see how educational methods guided by these animal training theories could ever do much to train the student in habits of independent judgment or free thought, which suggests that mainstream educational practice is not designed to produce individuals with the capacity to think independently or to dare challenge the status quo. Certain alternative educational methods do exist, namely Steiner or Waldorf schools, as well as the option of homeschooling. This is not to suggest that every facet of modern mainstream education needs to be abolished or even greatly reformed from a structural standpoint. Just a suggestion that whilst mainstream education is referred to as liberal, it is often liberal in name only. A portion of the etymological roots of the word liberal come from the Latin words liberalis and liber. Within the context of education, the word liberal pertained to the study of those arts and sciences which are considered to provide general knowledge, as opposed to the vocational, occupational, technical or mechanical training of today. Nowadays, very few specialists actually possess substantial general knowledge. The prevalence of the generalist or polymath has been greatly diminished, as the Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset aptly wrote in his classic work the revolt of the masses, the specialist knows very well his own tiny corner of the universe, but he is radically ignorant of all the rest. Liberalis effectively meant pertaining to or befitting of a dignified, honorable, free and noble individual, whilst Liber meant book and carried with it the implication of being well-read and broadly educated. Those who claim to be liberal nowadays are very rarely well-read or broadly educated, not to mention they often carry themselves in undignified and ignoble fashion, especially when confronted by ideas they subjectively consider abhorrent. Thus, the true mark of a real liberal, or at the very least someone worth debating, would be demonstrated in their conduct and their emotional control, even if both parties disagree. But nowadays, things have collapsed so much that debate is often futile, and the regrettable outcome of this is violence. The idea of bringing reasoned debate to a full-scale riot in the hope of dampening the chaos is clearly ignorant, but so is mindless submission to and engagement with violence outside of reasonable self-defense. William Shakespeare said, All the world is a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Yes, but do we live simply to do things and to serve, to perform, however well the tasks required of our times? Are we merely actors who have learned well or poorly? the lines written for them by someone else or dictated by necessity? And is there no understanding of the meaning of the part we play or of the drama as a whole? Is there no one through his education meant to contribute something original to the drama of life? 
is it then not possible to play the role of theatre critic? The notion of being a practical learner, or learning by doing, is a common thing in the world of today, as genuine academia and discussion is replaced by mere repeated performance. Granted the individual may learn how to do the task, but he does not thereby learn what to do, nor why it is done. True education has to do with insight, with valuing, with understanding, with the development of the power of discrimination, not to be rude, cruel, or vulgar, but to set and uphold standards and expectations, fortifying the ability to make informed choice amongst the possibilities of experience, and to think and act in ways that distinguish man from beast. The ancients thought of education as the attainment of virtues, wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. It is the pursuit of knowledge which gives self-mastery. It is an interest which is never exhausted, but grows always broader and richer. It consists not in learning tricks, but in developing ourselves. It is a victory which gradually transforms the whole personality and reveals itself as quality in words and in actions. The educated mind possesses a kind of sincerity, while the ignorant mind possesses a smug sense of clever insincerity. According to Martin, the pathetic thing about the wrongly educated, i.e. those who are trained merely to produce an effect or to get results or outcomes, is that in the deeper human relationships, they rarely know what sincerity actually is. They have no concept of it. Hence, simply put, education is the antithesis of vulgarity. On the surface, education for the sake of it, in the case of the bookish academic, is considered useless. But in truth, it is a way of life in itself, which has value for its own sake, a personal achievement which possesses intrinsic worth. Education is not to be pursued purely for something extrinsic or material to show off to the world, which is why it is entirely possible that a working poor autodidact who on the surface appears to be basic or simple may in fact be far more educated and brilliant than a financially wealthy man with a university degree. Then again, the implication that money has no value can be used as a cope and provide one with an excuse to remain poor. A high-value man would not make such comments. Whilst money may not be of the highest value, it still has undoubted value in the world within which we live. By the modern interpretation, a high-value man would seek to ascend the ladder in every facet of life as much as possible. While education is not, quote, for anything, that is to say for an outcome, it will indirectly improve everything that people do. Animal training may give one the means to make a living, but liberal education gives living a meaning. Once again, the difference between being trained like an animal and being educated lies in the true understanding of what it is you do and why you do it. A simple example of this phenomenon can be found in the profound monologue scene from the 1997 drama film Goodwill Hunting. The brilliant, classically educated autodidact Will Hunting is given the opportunity to work for the National Security Agency, the NSA, the Intelligence Agency of the United States Department of Defense. 
one aspect of his role would consist of codebreaking. While an intelligent yet blindly obedient worker who has been properly trained may break a code with no questions asked, Will is different. Such is his depth of thought and capacity for reason, which he gained through his broad education, that he launches into a passionate monologue where he eventually concludes through his own independent judgment that based upon his conception of morality, the potential consequences of the job he would be asked to do are wrong, and thus he cannot justify working for the agency. However, it is likely that Will has this unique insight and brutally honest outlook on life, due not only to his exceptional intelligence, but also due to the traumatic events of his life, which have shaped his perception with a hefty dose of the harsh reality. Thus, whilst his monologue is very prescient, there is also a significant amount of deep pain attached to the words he speaks, the mindset he lives in, and the worldview he espouses. As his therapist Sean Maguire points out, perhaps Will is scared to take the first step and thus figure out who he really wants to be because all he sees is every negative thing 10 miles down the road. That inclination toward brutal realism and pessimism is not only possibly accurate, but is also consistent with the psychological development of someone who has been traumatized and riddled with anxiety. When assessing the nature of man, consider these thought-provoking anecdotes. If man is the measure of all things, and a psychologist views the brain as a computer, i.e. a predictable deterministic machine governed by cause and effect, is man then a machine? Thus, if man is a machine, like other machines, are machines in general the measure of all things, through the development and proliferation of technology and automation? Does a psychologist who seemingly wants to help people actually do man an injustice by assuming man is entirely predictable and understandable? Is it humane to view man as a deterministic machine? No not by supposedly liberal standards, so why do so many insist upon doing it? Yet simultaneously, many would proclaim the uniqueness of humanity and suggest there are no machines as unique or as complex as man. So is man a machine or animal at all? Surely a higher capacity for reason is indication enough that man is not merely an animal or machine, but a higher form of being, so perhaps he should start acting like it. He can reach this higher level of being through learning to value education, personal development, and spiritual growth above that of material possession or outcome. Such is my passion for the topics I discuss that I've started a Patreon and now most recently an Odyssey channel because I know that passion won't fade. So if you enjoyed the video or find my analysis and insight valuable, please consider liking the videos, subscribing to the channel or showing some support and join the discussions of upcoming video essay topics and future book reviews. Your recommendations would be welcome. I will eventually post channel updates regularly on there and will give you some insight into the next books or ideas that will be used for content. I also plan to eventually create a Rumble and Subscribestar account, so come back to the channel and keep your eyes open for that. Follow the links in the video description below or on the channel about page under links.
Thank you very much for the feedback and support you've shown thus far. I'll talk to you next time.